Hello, this is Peter Gogg. I'm the Forest Health Manager for the North Dakota Forest Service. Um, the following presentation is about disturbance ecology and how tree stress and vigor and the relationship to the variables that shape changes in forest structure and composition help us understand some of the challenges we see with growing trees in our North Dakota landscape. So the first thing to consider is what is a disturbance? According to White and Pickett from 1985, a disturbance is any event that is relatively discrete in time and space that disrupts the structure of an ecosystem, a community, or a population, and changes resource availability or the physical environment. Now I wanted to introduce this topic to our presentation series because disturbances, or the interrelationships between the biotic and abiotic components of the environment, are the major mechanisms that must coincide with vegetative growth in order to balance biomass production with resource availability. Without disturbance or management activities, vigorous tree growth will decline through time. The resources that are considered in this definition are the same resources that play into all aspects of tree growth, and that's light water and nutrient. We often think of disturbances as large scale short duration events that make dramatic changes to ecosystem, causing extensive mortality. The reality is a disturbance can exist at any scale, from a single tree to the landscape, and occur over time frames from seconds to years. The impacts of disturbance depend on the type, the time, the size, the severity, how frequently they occur, and how they interact with other disturbances. Many of the same abiotic and biotic stresses we are considering when assessing site characteristics or plantings become the disturbances that ultimately cause the reshaping of growing space and resource distribution or availability. In North Dakota, we tend to experience more weather-induced disturbances like drought, storms, and extreme temperatures rather than many of the biotic variables. The vast majority of weather disturbances become spatially large and indiscriminate, unlike many biotic disturbances, which tend to be directly tied to a specific species or their current state of vigor. It's important to keep in mind that as vigor declines because of an abiotic disturbance variable, like unseasonably high temperatures or a lack of moisture, that physiological tolerances of the dominant species can become suppressed, allowing insects and pathogens to further decrease tree vigor, causing decline and ultimately mortality. Our traditional perspective on how forests and trees evolve has generally focused on the theory of succession, which moves ecosystems from pioneer to climax composition and structure through time. This theory tends not to address the diverse scale of disturbances, particularly to individual or groups of trees by endemic insects and endophytic organisms that encourage mortality in trees that already have decreasing vigor. As trees increase in size, they consume growing space, which causes a limitation on available resources, reducing vigor of less ideally positioned species. The endemic insects and pathogens essentially wait for susceptible low vigor trees to develop so they can complete their life cycles using the tissues of these trees, further reducing vigor and causing further decline and often mortality. These small scale disturbances change the structure and relationship of trees to their growing space, reallocating resources to allow natural forest stands to evolve to the composition and structure seen at any given point. Without the presence of a large scale disturbance event, diversity of composition and structure will increase through insect and disease disturbance to individual and groups of trees. The severity of a disturbance will depend on the composition and structure of vegetation within an ecosystem, leading to either large or small scale alterations. Generally, Higher severity disturbances like large wind events or severe fire encourage low diversity. Likewise, low severity disturbance encourages more diversity.
The successional theory fits best with the large-scale severe disturbances or in systems that are starting from an almost lifeless state. Regardless, disturbances of all scales and time frames will introduce variability to the structure of biological components and the composition of species as regeneration occurs. These same processes exist in our conservation plantings, despite being introduced to the landscape, as species work to regenerate, grow, and die as growing space continuously evolves. The main difference is that we are planting trees in locations where they may not have established or regenerated naturally given the climate and site conditions. This is why we stress the need to care for planted trees, because they are frequently planted in, at a disadvantage, making them more susceptible to a range of disturbances. This should emphasize a need for performing management activities intended to introduce the compositional and structural diversity that helps maintain vigor across the planting. In a conservation planting, we become the mechanism of disturbance, introducing changes in resource distribution, and then introducing the new species. The historical disturbance mechanisms of the prairie were dominated by fire, grazing from large mammals, and drought. These three disturbances effectively limited the establishment of trees in the prairie landscape unless adequate moisture was available, which was primarily dictated by topography. The establishing seedlings would either experience a killing fire, which was exacerbated by suffocating grass, be chewed off by grazing mammals, depending upon the species, or be stunted by limited growing season moisture. Regardless, the cards were stacked against establishing trees, with the conditions of the site preventing them from outcompeting the grass. Since European settlement of the prairie, the natural and historical disturbance regime has changed significantly, essentially removing fire and grazing from the equation. Drought, on the other hand, continues to be a major variable, frequently introducing difficult growing conditions for planted and naturally regenerating trees. The anthropogenic consequence of our decision to plant trees in a landscape generally too dry for tree growth creates an unusual context where drought is frequently limiting. This brings us full circle with our discussion on the difficulties that trees face while trying to establish and reproduce in this landscape. By removing large mammal grazing and significantly decreasing the frequency and scale of fire, trees can grow, but they do it at rates slower than you would find where niche conditions are better suited to the necessary resource availability. With reduced availability of water and the removal of historical disturbance mechanisms, the only natural mechanisms left to alter the community and population structure, thereby altering resource and substrate availability, are insects and diseases. In native forest communities, Franklin et al. 1987 talked of the complex insect pathogen tree site climate interactions that are intertwined in the causality governing tree mortality. This concept focuses on the main causes of abiotically driven vigor loss, creating the scenario for establishing populations of insects and diseases in trees. The establishment of small-scale biotic disturbances has always been present as a mechanism of decline in mortality in all communities but historically was less prevalent because larger disturbances occurred at a frequency that made these small disturbances play less of a role. Now, insects and disease issues are very likely far more prevalent, taking up the slack that exists without larger historical disturbance events. This creates an interesting scenario, since many planted species are introduced and may not have natural insect and disease predators within the communities in our landscape. Planting introduced species creates a whole new context for symbiotic relationships, opening the door to evaluating the dynamics and distribution and dispersal of insects and disease that may have otherwise never existed here. 
As time elapses with an ever-growing list of introduced trees, we are seeing that symbionts seem to find their way into these new ecosystems, which opens the door to a whole new level of understanding. All this understanding of disturbance has led managers to the idea of emulating natural disturbance to both address the necessity of disturbance in ecosystems, but also to theoretically maintain natural processes and services that benefit our need. The premise is that emulating natural disturbance puts in place practices that mimic natural ecological processes, that perpetuate the evolutionary environment and ecosystem functions. In our generally unnatural context of conservation plantings, this tends to point to the idea that we can let the insects and diseases guide us on which individual trees might need to be removed from the site. Through time, the nature of insects and disease in plantings will introduce decline in mortality, but the rate or degree to which it affects these trees is likely going to be at an earlier point in their life cycle than in a natural setting. Being proactive by evaluating the presence of decline, insects, or diseases in conservation plantings may be the better approach to sustaining trees in this context. Removing trees that are showing signs or symptoms of health issues when they are present within a planted group could improve the situation for the remaining trees, whereas nursing an ailing tree may simply encourage susceptibility in more trees. Some examples of letting health issues guide management might be the removal of a small group or each alternating spruce when needle cast becomes present. This removal increases airflow and allows drier conditions that are less conducive to fungal sporulation. Treating with a fungicide and not removing infected trees will not improve the availability of resources to bolster remaining trees. Not removing trees and applying fungicide will not improve growing space resources to help resist other issues in the future. Also, needle cast spores can be wind dispersed, which raises the potential of reoccurrence, assuming that fungicide application eliminated the fungus in the first place. Another circumstance might be the presence of wood and bark boring insects, which would be a an issue that affects low vigor trees. In many conservation planting situations, you may find that there are interspersed trees that are showing signs of a particular insect infestation. There may be good reason to remove these injured trees and consider planting another species in its place to encourage the adjustment of allocated resources. The point of this presentation topic was to push the idea that biotic agents that influence decreased functionality of vegetative tissues cause decreases in growth that occur at any scale. These agents have always existed as part of every disturbance regime in every type of vegetated community. We are only recently starting to recognize insects and diseases as disturbance mechanisms because the elimination of the larger historic disturbances has increased their prevalence. So this should demonstrate the necessity of reallocating resources and substrate availability through time. And this is all done to maintain diversity of an ecosystem and ultimately its sustainability. So to conclude, there are really three important concepts. The first is that the presence of insects and disease on a tree are a strong indicator of a lowered vigor. The second is that management is generally the removal and planting of new trees, and this is a process that inadvertently mimics mortality and disturbance from insects and disease. And then last, emulating natural disturbance means that insects and disease are showing us what to remove. So thank you for your time. As always, uh, our last slide here is to give you 
the contact information if you should run into tree issues. Um, there is a form through the ND Invasives website that you can fill out the Sick Tree Assistance form, and I will respond to that form. Um, you can also use the QR code on this, this slide with your phone to reach the same form, and I will follow the same process. So again, thank you very much for your time. Have a good day.